Hello, welcome to this Test of Time session. I am the chair of SC22 Test of Time Award. My name is Eva Dielman, and I'm from the University of Southern California. This is a pleasure for me to introduce this session, this very special session to you. This year's winners are Chang Xing Su and Wu Cheng Feng for their paper, A Power Aware Runtime System for High Performance Computing, which was presented as SC2005 almost 17 years ago. The talk today will be given by Wu Feng, who is a professor of computer science and electrical computer engineering at Virginia Tech. He also directs the Systems Networking and Renaissance Grokking Laboratory. Wu received his PhD in computer science from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign in 1996. Please help me welcome Wu, Wu to the stage. Congratulations. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, both Chun Singh and I are truly honored and, and humbled by this recognition of our work from uh, SC 2005, which I think they said it's nearly 20 years ago. Uh, we'd like to thank the uh, Supercomputing uh, Test of Time Award Committee, uh, as well as all of you out there, uh, the SC community, for your support and proliferation of all things green, if you will, uh, for supercomputing uh, at SC. And as the saying goes, it takes a village to raise a child. And, and in this case, of course, the child is figuratively green supercomputing. So being recognized by the SC community is, is, is quite special to me, um, as I've been involved in some capacity with SC since SC 2000, uh, which was my first SC. And it was also where my first uh, SC uh, paper was published on the, on the failure of TCP in high-performance computational grids. Uh, and coincidentally, uh, SC 2000 was also held in uh, Dallas, Texas, right here. Um, and then furthermore, in, in the following year, uh, we ended up demoing a, a green uh, computing system cluster uh, in our booth uh, the following year uh, that would end up serving as a precursor to the paper that you will be hearing about today uh, and then subsequently leading to the green 500 list. Um, so we initially thought that we'd dig up uh, uh, our old presentation from 2005 uh, and, and re-deliver the presentation in greater depth. Um, but Chan Singh um, noted that many of you out there uh, would have been toddlers or, or youths. Uh, I can't really see for sure out there. Um, but um, when this work was uh, published back in 2005, and when green supercomputing was arguably uh, considered supercomputing heresy, uh, so to speak. Um, so we've decided not to simply recycle the talk, uh, and, and instead to structure the talk in such a way that, uh, that it'll provide you with an overview of the SC 2005 technical talk, uh, but in the broader context of, of what came before it, uh, what led to the paper, and what has come after it. Okay, so with that, so for some initial context, here is the original uh, SC 2005 uh, paper and the title slide from our PowerPoint presentation. Uh, Chen Singh and I did this work when we were at Los Alamos National Laboratory as part of the Radiant team in uh, the Advanced Computing Laboratory within the Compu Computer and Computational Sciences Division. And here's the updated slide for this talk today, uh, a power-aware runtime system for high-performance computing past, present, future. Um, visually, this uh, SC05 power aware runtime system work was preceded visually here on the left uh, by Green Destiny, uh, an energy efficient supercomputer, which was 240 nodes uh, in six square feet, uh, which I used to refer to as about the size of a telephone booth, but nowadays with Gen Y and Gen Z, uh, the, the notion of telephone booth is, is no more. Uh, more importantly, though, uh, this supercomputer 
when booted up disk list consumed only 3.2 kilowatts of power. That's the electrical equivalent of two hair dryers for a 240 node supercomputer. And then on the right, what you'll see is a handful of artifacts and entities that came after uh, this, this paper, uh, Powerware Runtime System for High Performance Computing. Um, uh, now, Chen Sing is, is affiliated with uh, Oak Ridge National Laboratory uh, while, while I'm at uh, Virginia Tech. And so let's roll the, the time back to, to the early 2000s and then rapidly move it forward and hear about uh, a little bit more about the Powerware runtime system and, and uh, moving forward from, from this work. So the title of the talk says the Powerware runtime system. And so to we'll start out with a, a brief definition is that we look at it as a system that automatically and transparently adapts its voltage and frequency settings to achieve significant power reduction and energy savings while maintaining performance. Okay. Um, <clears throat> however, the, the CPU performance of a processor is proportional to the uh, clock frequency and the square of its voltage supply. So simply willy-nilly lowering the frequency and voltage is insufficient to significantly reduce power consumption while maintaining performance because even though CPU power is proportional to the square of the voltage supply and frequency, CPU performance is also proportional to the frequency. So if we're lowering the frequency to save power, we're also potentially impacting the performance of, uh, of the, the, the code that you're running on, on that processor. Um, <clears throat> Further compounding matters is that the scaling of the voltage and frequency of a processor takes on the order of milliseconds. So you can see that in the figure on the right, uh, where on the y-axis you have uh, the number, uh, amount of microseconds on the y-axis, and on the x-axis is uh, the difference in the clock frequency that you're, you're scaling. So like if you're scaling from uh, two gigahertz down to one gigahertz, then you'd go to the one gigahertz uh, difference on the x-axis and look up along the y-axis and you'll see that that takes 6,000 microseconds or six milliseconds. Uh, that's not too long. I mean, in human time, six milliseconds is, is there and, and is gone. But unfortunately, in computer time, this many milliseconds, upwards as much as uh, 8,000 8, microseconds or eight milliseconds is on the order of 10, 000, uh, 10 million clock cycles. So if we decide to change the frequency and voltage of a processor to be more energy efficient, we have to be, we have to be sure that we really want to do that. Otherwise, the overhead of just waiting for that voltage and frequency to scale is 10 million clock cycles and that will ultimately impact the performance of your, of your code because your, your code is bu busy spending time scaling the frequency and voltage when, when it could be doing uh, computing. Um, so ultimately, we wanna do this all uh, with a goal of uh, energy efficient uh, and, and green supercomputing. Uh, we wanna create a power aware runtime system to scale the voltage and frequency intelligently uh, to deliver significant power reduction while maintaining performance and achieving this goal of energy efficient or green supercomputing. So why is green supercomputing important? Well, because it turns out that too much uh, power will affect the efficiency, reliability, availability, and cost of, of a system. And there's some empirical evidence. We had a, we had a cluster um, in our machine room, quote unquote, which you see a picture of behind me. Uh, we, uh, through some uh, um, data gathering, we found that in our machine room, when the temperature of the machine room, which is in this warehouse, was 70 to 75 degrees Fahrenheit, we had a failure approximately once per week. And then in the summer, when it got warmer in there, uh, the failures occurred at a, a rate of twice per week. Um, and of course, when the, the, 
the system or the cluster failed, staff resources were expended to have to diagnose and fix the failures. And, and what we found through the empirical evidence is that if we take Arrhenius's equation from chemistry and we apply it to bio, uh, microelectronics, excuse me, uh, as uh, the computer and defense industries did in the 1980s, we find that for every 10 degrees Celsius increase in temperature, the failure rate of a system will double. And so that's what we see through that empirical evidence, albeit it's, 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 uh, it, it's, it's one set of data points from one, one location, uh, in this case at Los Alamos National Laboratory. So in this case, it, why is green supercomputing important in, in our case? Well, again, it's because it affects efficiency, reliability, availability, and cost. And as a consequence, uh, we needed to address this issue of power consumption in order, in order to address our needs to get useful work done in our quote unquote machine room. So as the saying goes, the, for us, uh, necessi necessity is uh, the mother of invention. And as a consequence of, of that experience, we created this supercomputing and small spaces projects in the late 2000s to improve uh, efficiency, reliability, availability, and the cost of, uh, of administering these systems. Um, in some sense, if you look at this back then, when we started this in 2000, uh, at the turn of the century, uh, we could look at it as a traditional supercomputer versus a supercomputing and small spaces supercomputer. Um, the traditional supercomputer would be, from an analogy perspective, like your Formula One race car. It wins the raw performance, uh, but the reliability can be poor enough that it requires frequent maintenance, and as a consequence, the throughput is low. Um, alternatively, you can sacrifice just a little bit of high-end performance for better overall efficiency, reliability, and availability uh, by having something, I just picked a, a fast car. <laughs> uh, it's probably pretty reliable, a Nissan 370Z. It loses the raw performance, but high rel reliability results in high throughput or miles driven or answers per month. And I guess this will, this will show my age, but uh, for those of you who remember the, the days of the movie called Cannonball Run, I mean, you would race from, I think it's New York to Los Angeles, or was it Los Angeles to New York? I can't, I can't remember, remember that, but are you, gonna, are you gonna use a Formula One race car to race across the United States, or are you gonna use maybe something like a Nissan 370Z? All right, well, this supercomputing and small spaces project, we started in 2000, we spent much of 2001 uh, uh, looking at what to do. Uh, it led to the debut of a pair of 24 node uh, clusters at supercomputing 2001, as I alluded to earlier. Each one was a 24 node cluster that consumed a mere 30, uh, sorry, a mere 300 to 350 watts when running a scientific code, um, a real live scientific code. So 300 to 350 watts, you're thinking three light bulbs. And what was it running? It was running a, a, a large uh, scale uh, N-body uh, gravitational simulation uh, in, in the cos uh, arena of cosmology. Um, so you see in the upper right, there was, uh, tw that's 24 nodes. They, don't, they, look like, they look like PCI cards, and they're effectively the size of PCI cards, but they're separate compute nodes, right? Um, and uh, so we had two of these 24-node uh, uh, compute nodes, and what's on the left uh, uh, is, is running on the uh, Metablade cluster, and then what's on the right is running on the Metablade 2 cluster, so people could see uh, what the uh, performance differences were in running uh, on these two very low, uh, low power, energy efficient supercomputers. Um, so this is, this is the, uh, 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 the fellow back here is a collaborator uh, from Los Alamos National Laboratory, Michael Warren, who as many of you are aware, he's, he's won multiple Gordon, Gordon Bell Awards. Um, 
people for work uh, such as, as this. And so he ran this on, uh, back then, uh, gigaflops was, <laughs> was really fast. Um, uh, so uh, Metablade was running 2.1 gigaflops for his uh, n-body uh, simulation of galaxy formation, and it was 3.3 gigaflops on Metablade 2. Um, <clears throat> And the development of the system from uh, November 2000 to uh, November 2001, when we debuted it at, at SC, um, the sex, I mean, the, what we viewed as the success of this demo and, and the amount of feedback that we got uh, when we were demoing this on the uh, exhibit hall floor, it led us to quickly scale up our 24 uh, node Metablade cluster into a, a, a the Metablade cluster, which is in a 3U chassis, each one's in a 3U chassis, into a full-fledged 240-node supercomputer in the span of about four to five months, uh, immediately following supercomputing 2001. So literally after this, this went out on the exhibit floor, and based on the feedback that we got, it was like, okay, let's, let's really drive this home and take it to its, its, its next stage or next uh, phase. And so, um, whoops, uh, sorry, I forgot that. There was no unscheduled failures in the 2001, uh, during 2001 we were developing this system. So uh, I was in contrast to the, the, the data that I showed you before with our traditional cluster. So this is it, this is a 240 node uh, supercomputer cluster uh, in six square feet. Uh, it was running a one gigahertz transmeta uh, CPU uh, with high performance code morphing software. So the processor was actually a hardware software hybrid. Um, uh, and, and as a point of trivia, if you will, Linus Torvalds uh, was working at Transmeta at the time. Linus Torvalds was, of course, the inventor of the Linux kernel. Uh, he was responsible for the dynamic runtime compiler called code morphing, code morphing software uh, that would uh, be bundled as part of the hardware. Um, and what was happening, what we found was that um, uh, with the way that the hybrid uh, software hardware was doing, uh, we were having some uh, performance issues and uh, in working with uh, Linus uh, in terms of doing some just-in-time compilation of the the x86 instruction stream to the VLI, underlying VLIW architecture, we were able to improve the performance by a factor of two, which I, I should be showing here. So we had a low power processor, it was only six watts, and um, through working with uh, uh, Linus Torvalds, uh, we did some hardware software co-design that we ended up being two times faster, as well as uh, two times cleaner. Okay. Um, uh, in total, it was 240 gigaflops, and we uh, ran Linpack on it. We got, uh, uh, we only got, a, uh, we got less than 50% uh, efficiency. Uh, we, we did manage to get 101 gigaflops in March 2002, which was equivalent uh, HPL Linpack number to uh, uh, 256 CPU SGI Origin 2000 at the time. Uh, again, I mentioned it only consumed 3.2 kilowatts. Um, and so you know, that's equivalent to, uh, electrically equivalent to uh, two hair dryers. Um, and it was no unscheduled uh, downtime in its 24 month lifetime that, 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 that we stood it up. And this is uh, running in a dusty 80 to 90 degree Fahrenheit warehouse and at 7,200 feet above sea level. Yet, in 2002, uh, due in large part to our community's fixation on performance, under, and understandably so at the time, um, with a fixation on performance as defined by speed of execution, we saw uh, um, you know, quite a bit of, uh, I, I, I can't try, I'm trying to think of a diplomatic word, but we got a lot of flack for, 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 for doing, uh, uh, doing this. Um, and there was even one quote that I, I'm not going to attribute to the person who said it, but, but he, he said, Green Destiny is so low power, it runs just as fast as when it is unplugged. Okay. Um, so, 
he might not have seen the, the fact that we'd, we had done an n-body simulation of a galaxy formation on a precursor to it, and we were able to run a, a billion particle simulation on Green Destiny uh, uh, um, with, with that uh, telephone booth size BRAC. Um, but again, due to the community's fixation on performance, uh, is defined by speed of execution at the time. After Green Destiny debuted, we saw a number of variations of Green Destiny that sought to replace our high-performance Transmeta hybrid processor with a higher-performing traditional CPU, in particular a mobile CPU at 35 watts instead of the 6 watts of, of, of the Transmeta processor. And this is what happened. So this is, a, this is a representative image of the original Green Destiny on top. Each square represents uh, uh, a processor. Um, the, uh, I think, I say, the, the height of the box is the amount of memory that's being used. The color of the box um, is, is, yeah, I think I th that, that's the memory. Um, uh, then we, we, on this, we, we were trying to run MPI Blast on 210 nodes of Green Destiny, as well as the higher performing Green Destiny replica, or what we call the higher performing fake. Um, and this, if you will, Green Destiny replica or fake was actually put together just six months after our, our, our debut of Green Destiny. And what you can see here is that um, there are no dead nodes in Green Destiny, but in the higher performing Green Destiny, there were 82 nodes that failed or dead. Um, this ultimately led to a, a perfect storm for innovation and leading to uh, uh, the talk uh, uh, for today. Um, we got criticism that it's arguably mediocre performance on non-commodity non parts. Uh, so we had taken a hardware-based approach with some code, runtime code morphing software uh, to improve the performance and enable it to be greener. But it still wasn't enough. Um, if people looked at it as being uh, very specific to, to um, uh, the applications that we were running on it. So what we did was we, uh, uh, we had the perfect storm of what we were doing on the hardware-based side with some code morphing software dynamically at runtime and some work that uh, Chun Sing had been doing with a compiler-based approach using instrumentation in order to profile and then manually insert DBFS, dynamic voltage and frequently scaling, uh, the scheduling functions uh, for serial codes on commodity hardware and that's what ended up resulting in this PowerWare runtime system for high-performance computing. So with that, uh, this is our software-based evolution of Green Destiny. That's what this, uh, that's the positioning of this paper, um, how it, it came from uh, the roots of, of uh, necessity being the mother of invention. Um, the software-based evolution of Green Destiny leveraged uh, dynamic voltage and frequency scaling. Uh, it's a commodity technology that traded CPU performance for power reduction by allowing the CPU supply voltage and or frequency to be adjusted at runtime. Its importance is that, as, as I already noted before, the power consumption is proportional to the square of the voltage supply and uh, the frequency. The challenge is that DVF-based PowerWare runtime systems uh, we need to determine when to adjust the current uh, frequency voltage setting and what to uh, adjust the, the setting to. Okay. Um, so uh, this software-based evolution of Green Destiny sought to leverage DVFS, which at the time was only available uh, on laptops through the early to mid-2000s. Uh, so yeah, that's what this is saying. So the use of DBFS was not new. Embedded systems, there were many, many of them that were using it. Uh, various interactive uh, applications as well. Um, but the first order design constraint in these embedded in, uh, systems was that uh, the focus was on power consumption rather than on performance. 
That is, we want to deliver a system that does not exceed a certain wattage and deliver the best performance uh, in that uh, power envelope. In supercomputing, the use of DDFS on supercomputers was new, um, and what we did was we looked to migrate it out of the embedded space and into the mobile space with uh, Chen Sing's uh, uh, initial compiler work on the commodity laptop at the time. And uh, it was here that we found that knowing when to use DDFS and, and what to set the, the settings to was, was uh, not an easy problem because of the overhead involved in scaling the voltage and the frequency. So the easiest way to uh, avoid this 10 million clock cycle overhead is to take a coarse grain approach and simply set the frequency and voltage before program execution and just leave it there. So this is an example of coarse grain DBFS tuning. We did it on a, a, a benchmark called Tomcat B. Uh, the manual DBFS tuning, um, if the performance, uh, 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 well, okay. If, if you look at the profile, the performance, uh, uh, the profile, the execution of the program at all possible frequency and voltage settings. And so what you see here is you see on the right is the highest uh, frequency and voltage, two gigahertz, 1.5 volts. Um, at the other end on the right side, you see 1.2 gigahertz and 1.1 volt, and you have, see an intermediate setting in the middle. Um, the blue graph is the execution time normalized to running at the fastest uh, and highest voltage setting. Uh, and the red uh, bar is the amount of uh, system energy uh, that was used relative to running at the highest voltage and frequency. Um, and so when you do coarse grain DBFS tuning, you do a profile like this, and then you look at it and say, all right, well, I'm only going to say allow for 5% performance degradation. And if that's the case, I look at these, these numbers and I see that neither of the lower settings is 5% within that 5% performance constraint. And therefore, I would set my uh, algorithm to be at the highest frequency and voltage and would not save any uh, power or, or, or um, energy. So, so we could move on to a, a finer grained, albeit still manual process, by profiling the execution behavior instead of the entire program, but do it in terms of the different components within the program, different basic blocks, and do finer grain tuning of the frequency and voltage there. We just have to be careful that we have to realize that it's going to take on the order of 10 million clock cycles to be doing the scaling, and we have to be very careful uh, about not just doing it willy-nilly. So this is the fine grain tuning. This shows that uh, the, the Tomcat V uh, has, um, there's uh, nine main loops and uh, the execution, the profiling of it, we had execution times uh, where we saw that the most time consuming loops were uh, loop two, loop five, loop seven, and loop eight. Okay. And uh, those loops are shown uh, from left to right at each frequency voltage setting there. Um, and for readability, we normalized all the loop execution times with respect to the execution time of running the entire benchmark uh, running at two gigahertz. Okay. Um, so, so what you see here is that um, this, uh, uh, at the two gigahertz, 1.5 volt setting, 32% of the execution time is spent in loop two, 24% uh, is spent in loop five, 18% is on loop seven, and 18% uh, uh, is on loop eight. Um, and then the remaining 8% is spent on the other loops. So with a 5% performance slowdown constraint, um, we could execute loop two, for example, at 1.6 gigahertz. And then just leave everything at the highest, everything, all the other parts of the program at the highest setting. And we'd only sustain a 3% slowdown. Um, and you could do other, other different combinations of things. For example, we could run, we could, uh, we could just run uh, loops five, seven, and eight, which is sh shown uh, over here to the right, 
uh, and run that at 1.2 gigahertz, and you can see that uh, the performance slowdown is, is marginal because uh, uh, the, the, uh, those loops are not sensitive, as sensitive to uh, compute intensive uh, computation. So, leveraging that knowledge and standing on the shoulders of giants in terms of what we, we, we've gathered from the community and did our own testing as well, we then moved to, to trying to make this approach be an automated, transparent process that runs on commodity technology uh, to address, if you will, the naysayers of, of, of going about doing low power supercomputing with uh, with a green destiny approach. And uh, again, uh, reiterating it again is, is that um, th there's a trade-off between processor performance and power reduction, uh, where power is proportional to the square of the voltage supply times frequency, and the processor performance is proportional to the frequency. And so when we execute, uh, when we look at the execution time of many programs, we see that they're insens insens uh, excuse me, insensitive to CPU change, uh, and, and why? It's because of the memory at I.O. wall, uh, sometimes uh, referred to as the brick wall as well. And so what you see here is for the NAS uh, integer sort benchmark, running at two gigahertz versus one gigahertz uh, results in only a 4% degradation in performance. And what do we get by allowing uh, just a 4% degradation in performance? We end up with a 60% decrease in energy consumption. So just for a little, just taking a little bit off of the performance, it's still pretty much the same performance, we are reducing our energy consumption by 40%. Uh, I'm sorry, I said 40%, 60%. <laughs> We're consuming 40% of the energy uh, that was otherwise used on the two gigahertz processor. Um, let's see. Uh, let's see, I'll go to the next one. Okay, so why is previous work not good enough? Well, uh, folks really hadn't been looking at trying to tackle this problem uh, at runtime uh, because the mechanisms that we had are so uh, coarse. Uh, you're talking about on the orders of milliseconds to change things when the computer underneath you is running on the order of nanoseconds uh, in terms of its clock speed. Um, and, and then to make it even more difficult, we, the program behavior will depend on the data inputs. The program behavior is hard to predict. I mean, we knew about NAS integer sort benchmark because we, we were running it and we, we knew what the behavior was uh, and we could see that, that we could get these kind of performance gains, um, I should say, these types of energy savings for uh, not much change in the performance. Um, so uh, we, we looked into and uh, profiled source code. Uh, it, it was really expensive, it's manual. And so the idea is automation and transparency are the keys to this. And so what we did was we formulated this problem. This is the, this is the only really technical part and I'm just gonna you know, brush over it. Uh, we formulated this problem as a linear programming uh, problem for energy optimal uh, dynamic voltage and frequency scaling. Uh, the DVFS system exports N frequency uh, and uh, frequency and uh, uh, voltage settings uh, and the total execution time. Uh, and then given that you have a program with a deadline D, which is noted, noted in the constraints uh, underneath the subject to, uh, uh, line in that white box. Um, we find a DVFS schedule uh, for the different time steps T1 through Tn such that uh, we minimize the objective function which is uh, minimizing E. Okay. And T is the power. Um, so uh, we can construct this energy optimal solution uh, in constant time if the execution time versus the energy curve is convex, which is what it is uh, for uh, the AMD family of processors at the time that we were testing it on. And so what we are doing here is we're embracing the power wall uh, or the brick wall, is selecting the right setting at the right time for the workload at hand, and this ended up serving as the basis for what we call our beta adaptation algorithm 
in our power-aware runtime system. Uh, just so, some quick, quick results here uh, in the interest of time. So you could see on the, on the uh, left table, uh, we were consuming 25% uh, less power than not having any power management. Uh, you could use the Linux on demand uh, 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 governor and, and you'd only save 4%. Um, and then on the flip side, if you take a look at the energy efficiency in terms of uh, uh, business ops per watt, that's what the spec JBB, uh, it's a Java business benchmark workload, uh, we were achieving 123.7% of uh, uh, the energy efficiency uh, relative to uh, not having any power management at all. Um, so in order to do this, we had to do this on the fly uh, calculation of computing intensity where in, in our case, beta closer to one would mean that it's very compute intensive, beta closer to zero means that it's not compute intensive, it's memory or IO uh, uh, bound. So we're not doing business applications here at supercomputing, uh, so uh, we also did this uh, on the high performance Linpack, and what you see here is that uh, many of the past green 500 submissions have used this kind of technique to submit a green optimized HPL run to improve their flops per watt rating. And what you should note here is, is that the blue line is our uh, power aware runtime system with uh, uh, the beta adaptation algorithm, that's in blue. Um, the red is just pedal to the metal, um, running full out. And what you see is that uh, we had a 15% power savings for only a 1% uh, loss in performance. Okay. So the contribution of the paper in the end was that we had a power aware runtime system based on commodity technology that automatically and transparently reduces both power and energy usage while maintaining the performance. We did it at the time on AMD uh, processors, and what we ended up delivering was the performance of a 70-watt Opteron that's uh, uh, equivalent to an 89-watt Opteron, but uh, of course saving uh, nearly 20 watts of power. Um, Let's see here. Uh, so the, the, in this power aware runtime system, we, uh, we use this beta adaptation, adaptation algorithm, and I'm not gonna get into the details of it, just to say, just to say that we have some usable tun tunable parameters. The interval I with which we're applying and updating what we should be doing the frequency and voltage scaling on, we're, the default is one for one second, because remember, to scale frequency and voltages takes on the order of uh, milliseconds, so we don't want our interval to be uh, much smaller than, than one second. Uh, and then the performance tolerance was set at 5%. We repeat this algorithm every I seconds, we compute the CPU boundedness, uh, and then compute the desired CPU frequency and associated voltage, and then execute the program at that associated uh, frequency and voltage. And, and in the interest of time, I'm gonna jump ahead through the, the computation and just show uh, some of the measurement setup, we, we, we'd stick this into a, a power strip, whoops. We'd stick this into a power strip and we'd use the Yokogawa WT uh, uh, voltmeter to, to um, uh, collect the, the power data. Um, these were the clusters that we ran on. We ran on an AMD 64 Athlon system uh, as well as an AMD Opteron system at the time. Um, and uh, this, is a, this is a comparison to the compiler work and what you see is that uh, the compiler based work uh, which is labeled by Sue in, in maroon, uh, poorly re regulated the DVFS induced performance slowdown, uh, whereas our beta algorithm uh, did much better in limiting performance loss to 5% or less in general. There are, there's a few that just bumped over a little bit over 5%. I'm gonna show you some results with respect to the NAS parallel benchmarks at the time. On average, we achieved 14% CPU uh, energy reduction for only a 5% slowdown on the AMD uh, Athlon 64 based compute cluster. Um, and then, uh, let's see, this one is, uh, 
this one is on the, yeah, 64 base cluster. You can see that the slowdown is in, in the uh, blue, uh, sh uh, uh, sh shaded blue, and then the, in, in the um, maroon is how much uh, uh, energy, uh, energy reduction that uh, you're seeing. Um, and so there, there are additional results on that. I think uh, the one that I wanted to focus, I don't say focus, but draw your attention to here is we actually, um, on average, we saved 18% uh, energy but, uh, and, and had a 3% performance slowdown on the Opteron base cluster. But in the case of uh, the MG benchmark, we actually got a performance improvement uh, as well. So with that, I'm going to uh, conclude with some, uh, what I look at three forward influencing takeaways is that I think uh, we've helped uh, uh, you know, have hardware vendors uh, provide more power measurement capability in their systems, more power saving knobs. Um, the research community is looking at uh, more hardware based solutions for low power computer design and software based solutions on power where scheduling algorithms. Um, and the standardization process, there's many folks out there with respect to APIs and benchmarking methodology that are uh, continuing the work of, of uh, this energy efficient green supercomputing goal. And so I want to thank the SC 2005 committee and community for their foresight in accepting such a paper uh, in turn, in, and in turn influencing the HPC community in a, a myriad of ways at a time when uh, such work was considered to be supercomputing heresy, uh, as you may recall, with Green Destiny being so low power that it ran just as fast as when it was unplugged. So this is just a, 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 a plot of, uh, of various things that uh, have emanated from, uh, not directly per se from this talk, but uh, uh, that have come about. You see in Fuchsia, there's research in PowerWare uh, scheduling in blue, there's hardware-oriented green supercomputing. In the green, these are the power-saving mechanisms or knobs that are being made available. In the light blue are the power measurement uh, uh, instruments or techniques. In the yellow are the different metrics that are used to evaluate the uh, systems. In the purple is benchmarking. And then finally in the pink is uh, the application interface. And so with that, uh, we see green supercomputing at SC here. I've, I, I'd encourage you uh, all to take a look at the, the different things that are going on in uh, supercomputing. And with that, I'm going to jump to the very end here and suggest that uh, you consider uh, the, 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 taking a look at the green 500 buff. Here's how energy efficient we've been. Uh, we were supposed to hit exaflop uh, in a 20 megawatt power envelope in 2015, and then it got pushed out to 2020, and, and, out, and out to here to Frontier, where we finally hit exaflop in 20 megawatts. And so with that, I will uh, stop here, and uh, there's time for a question or two. Uh, take Thank that. you. If you have a question, please step to the microphone, uh, Michaela. Thank you for the uh, inspiring talk. Um, indeed, South University of Tennessee, Knoxville. You know, we are looking today at a situation that when you wrote this paper seems quite uh, divo different. So we look at a situation in Europe where the energy is becoming very important. Country like Japan are also very sensitive. And so you sort of view the future at that time. Uh, but the question is, where is the sweet spot between uh, saving energy, which is a need of the society, and uh, pushing this machine, the supercomputer of today and tomorrow, to uh, generate scientific deliverable? It, it seems to me that is a contradiction between this, and I wonder if you can, if you envision a sweet spot between these two concepts of energy saving and pushing the scientific discovery on machine that are not designed for energy saving. Yeah, um, I, 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 to, to me, the sweet spot for the community is delivering the same or very close to the same performance while saving power. Um, I, in general, as a scientific computing community, we, we still 
ultimately want to get our answers faster, right? And, and um, you know, what I showed was like, we showed like we could get the same answer with a, a 71 watt Opteron uh, versus a 89 watt um, uh, Opteron. So we still got our performance while also saving energy. Um, Ultimately, in, in our community, performance is always going to be a first order design constraint. And my hope is, is that we just bring power to be on equal terms, if you will, um, without having to sacrifice any of that performance. And, and I feel like I didn't really answer you, your question exactly. I mean, the sweet spot is essentially deliver the performance on a, com on a commodity platform um, without adversely affecting the performance. but intelligently reducing uh, the energy only when you need it. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Unfortunately, we're out of time, so if we have further questions, maybe you can uh, stick around. Um, I wanted to mention also that the Test of Time Award will be given during the award ceremony on Thursday, and I hope to see you all there. Thank you very much. Thank you.